<laughs> take go three. Ahead, take three. Here we go. Yeah. We were going to try to do this quickly. We're already 15 minutes late, but let's let's give it a shot. Uh, and uh, now my presentation is not advancing. Aha! Okay, I do have an answer to that question. What to do if it's storming like crazy at your time of observation? But the answer is not clear cut. That is the challenge, and that's why I don't want to make things more confusing. I just want to let you know that there are, are options, and they're not all great. What are the issues we're dealing with here? If you have a big storm going on right at your scheduled time of observation, and remember why we chose 7 a.m. as our preferred time of observation. It's because, number one, it's less likely to be storming like crazy at 7 a.m., than at many other times of, of day. But more importantly, or equally importantly, we chose that time because it was the most likely time of day that the most observers in the most parts of the country could all report at the same time. If you're on the receiving end of our volunteer data, like the National Weather Service, like media, like uh, many other users, the River Forecast Centers, hydrologic applications, they would ideally like it if everybody in the country reported at 5 a.m. sharp, which is 12 Z, Greenwich Mean Time, Zulu, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that's been a standard time for global reporting, uh, but 7 a.m. was the best compromise we could come up with. And about 80% of our observers attempt to read their gauge within about plus or minus an hour or two from 7 a.m. Uh, and over time, hopefully even more, we'll be able to home in on that time. When we pop up a map on the Kokoraz website, and I'll pop some up here momentarily, uh, there we go. Uh, ideally, each dot will represent 24 hours ending at the time shown on this map. And of course, as you look, it says period ending 7 a.m., but it's got a little squiggly in front of it, which means approximately 7 a.m. because we're giving leeway. Now, you might have realized by now, if your observation time is more than a couple hours before or after 7 a.m., then it doesn't show up on the map just because plotting data from inconsistent periods results in wacky inconsistent maps and hence why we go for a standard observing time. Uh, but, uh, and then, oh, I just wanted to compare. This is what we had as of this morning at 7 a.m. after the reports had trickled in throughout the day. And by comparison, I just wanted to see what did the map look like one year ago today. And there it is, one year ago today, fairly similar, very small amounts of precipitation over only a limited part of the country, sort of the same part of the country. Last year, it was not heading into an East Coast snowstorm as opposed to this year when that little concentration of precipitation measured this morning was about to form a major storm hitting the mid-Atlantic and heading northeast from there. So that's the ideal. Everybody reports around 7 a.m. The re data all show up promptly. Data are distributed. But we're a volunteer network. We give lots of leeway to make it fun, make it easy. Uh, but if it is storming at the time of observation, here are some options. Well, one option is go out and take your measurements. Hope you don't get struck by lightning. Hope you don't slip on the ice. Hope you don't get caught in a big blizzard. And remember, at 7 a.m. in midwinter, it is cold, it is dark. And observations are not easy at that time. Uh, so that is an option, is to be out there in the middle of the storm, but it's not always the best option. Nice idea, not always recommended. What's another option? Wait until the storm is over. Well, that's a good plan. Uh, and that storm may end an hour later, but it may not end for another six or eight hours or even longer. So do you wait till the storm is over? Well, it seems like a good plan from a personal safety point of view uh, and avoiding getting wet. 
but it's not such a good plan in terms of our Kokoroz data reports and maps because now some of our reports may cover a 24-hour, some may cover 26, some may be 20, some may 38. Well, those maps will only cover plus or minus a couple hours from that if, in fact, you honestly tell when you report it. And that's what we do want you to do is when you do read your gauge at something other than your standard observation time, and I'll show that momentarily, uh, do report in the time of observation when you actually checked and read the gauge. If you checked it at 9.32, write down 9.32, not 7 a.m., even though that's the default. That means you have to click on that block and enter in the correct reading. I just wanted to show you an example because this was a day that spawned quite a few questions. January 11th of 2014, week and a half ago. It was a Saturday morning and there were severe storms rolling across the southeast from Georgia, in, well, from Alabama into Georgia and then into South Carolina and on into North Carolina. And this is the, a map for January 11th for Lexington County, South Carolina. And we're accustomed, this county has quite a few volunteers, which is what we love to see. Whenever you see multiple volunteers in a county, you got, start to see just how variable precipitation really is. But sometimes the variability we see is because people are doing their readings at different times while a storm is in progress. I can find better examples perhaps in the summer although we don't have that many early morning thunderstorms, but here was one. And here we see there's a 3.33 right beside a 1.71 that's really only about not much more than a mile and a half or so apart. This isn't a really huge county. And here's another couple stations more than an inch apart and not that far apart in distance. Are these real precipitation differences? Well, you go to the next day on the 12th, and then what you find was this 3.33 was an observer who waited till the storm was over but reported it as if it were a one-day report ending around 7 a.m. Uh, this report, this volunteer went out in the middle of the storm and got the reading, risked <laughs> staying dry, at, but got a clean reading for the 24-hour period and reported accordingly. And likewise, down here, there was some mismatch in observation times, uh, but it resulted in one reporting more the second day and less the first day, and vice versa. So I just wanted to alert you to the fact that we can, this is one thing that we battle with doing quality control is, is irregular observation times. And yet, it's a reasonable solution to a challenging problem. So what are some more options? Well, another option is don't put in a daily report and risk producing uh, some of these interesting conflicts w that we see. Wait and do a complete 48-hour report the next day and report it as a multi-day. And that is safe, accurate, doesn't cause any confusion, but then we miss out on the valuable daily information and no daily data points show up on either of those maps for either the first day or the second day. It does show up in all your summary reports and your acute precipitation accumulations, just not on the maps. So you see, once again, pros and cons. Uh, and then another option is to take an observation just as soon as you can after your scheduled time of observation, a slightly different observation time but make sure to report the actual time of observation. And this really works well as long as it's not more than about an hour or so different from your regular time. So that is truly a, an acceptable, I mean, all of these are acceptable re, uh, approaches. You see the, the dilemma we find ourselves in, but some result in better maps and more consistency. Uh, and Still more options, and this will scare you. Estimate the amount of rain or snow that has fallen as of 7 a.m. or whatever your regular time of observation is if it's not 7. 
and then take an actual reading later as the storm ends, then using a reasonable uh, interpolation based on the final reading and based on how hard you saw it raining and snowing, make a better estimate of what had fallen at your 7 a.m. time and go ahead and edit your initial estimate with that corrected value and then apply the remainder to tomorrow's report. And believe it or not, there are a number of professional weather and climate and water people in Kokoraz who are doing that, uh, avoiding being out in the worst of the storm, but still trying to provide uh, data that will match up tightly and cleanly with that standard observing time. Beginners, however, and many volunteers in Kokoraz have never done this sort of thing before. They just don't have the confidence yet to do this approach. Uh, one way to make your estimate more confident is to either have a, well, some people have automated gauges where they can get an approximate reading at the standard time of their report, put that in, and then adjust it to what the total re report was from their gauge later on. Uh, uh, or, and I forgot now what my other approach was going to be, but uh, you see what it is we're dealing with. So uh, maybe I should stop right now and take any questions. Henry, can you navigate uh, questions from the, from the field right now? I can, Nolan. We have one uh, gentleman asked to describe how to report snow on the ground when seven-eighths of the ground is bare and one-eighth of the ground is two inches deep. Ha <laughs> ha! I have the answer to that but I'm not going to give it right now because I'm going to cover it in a few of the that's actually in my materials to cover in the rest of the webinar. So thanks. Okay, here's another one. Nancy writes in, if I take a reading at, say, 730 and the reading is zero, and I know for sure no precipitation fell since 7 a.m., is it okay to leave the observation time as 7 rather than reporting at 730? Excellent question. The answer is yes. If, if you... If, if more time elapses and you don't get to your gauge, but you know that no precipitation fell, yes, you can use the standard observation time, the default time, and not change it. I do that myself very regularly. Okay, here's someone uh, writing in. Angela wants to know if I'm going out and want to take a, the reading earlier than my regular time. Can I report the earlier observation time? Uh, you can and in fact if you do it earlier than your your uh, scheduled time we appreciate it if, if you type in the actual time but again if you know that there will be no precipitation sometimes it's obvious you can again let it default to your 7 a.m. observation time please know that if you do try like if you try to do the report if you read the gauge at 555 and then try to enter your observation time at 5.55, but your default is 7. The computer system will not allow you to enter 5.55. It will allow you to enter 6. It will give you a one-hour leeway, or it will let you do it at 6 and still say it's 7, but it won't let you do it at 5.55. It only gives you 60 minutes prior to your default time. And here's another one, someone asking about if their report's set for 6 a.m., how do they change it to 7 a.m.? And I, I will hopefully do that a little bit later on when I bring the website up live. May, okay. people, people may not know it, but you can click right in that box and edit what's in that box. You just have to move your cursor into the time of observation box, click there, and then enter the correct time in that box. And we do have a, not just for snow, but uh, if, if you guys are out there have not trained at all and looked at our getting started with Kokoros slideshow, a lot of these questions, uh, I'm, I'm seeing a couple of them on here, they are mentioned in the, the training. So uh, that if you get a chance to go back and look at that, that would be great. Here's a, here's a re, uh, person asking, what if you're out of town and cannot get a backup to report for you? What do you do that? In, in that situation, you go directly to the multi-day accumulation. When you get back, you read what's there. If you were gone a relatively short amount of time, uh, you read what's in your gauge when you get back. 
If you believe it's representative and that you haven't lost too much to evaporation, you may then submit a multi-day report, as putting the first day of the accumulation period will be the day after your last report, and then the day the accumulation period ends will be when you actually check and empty the gauge and enter that in, and away you go. If you Here's feel that user. there's been evaporative loss that might render your reading unrepresentative, then it's best just to leave it empty. Here's someone writing in, is it a problem to collect the sample at 7 a.m. and do the reporting later on? It is totally acceptable to t take the reading at 7 a.m. and enter the data later. Some of our users are hoping that our, as many of our observers as possible will report at least before 9 a.m. because a lot of the National Weather Service and hydrologic uses use the data within a couple hours of 7 a.m. But for many of our climate uses, even if you enter the next afternoon or the next day or we even a week later, it's still very valid and appropriate. Now, Duke writes and wants to know if he, if he does that, uh, does he have to make notes in the comments section? So if he takes it at the proper time, reports later, does he need to put anything in the comments field? No. Uh, and please know that our computer system does keep track of when your report is, in fact, submitted. So while we don't know when you checked and emptied your gauge, we do know on our end when the report was received, and that piece of information shows up. And even when you do uh, view data, uh, some of the features will show uh, what the observation time was and what the submit time was, so we can tell. Okay, Nolan, it looks like we got a break in the action, and uh, with the questions, go ahead and, and roll it. Okay. Okay, ready, yeah. Yeah. ready set, go, phase two. Because so many questions come up with snow, many of the observing challenges relate to snow, I wanted to talk about snow. And in fact, Noah, who I don't believe is able to talk to tonight, he's often managing parts of our calls, but he was having technical difficulties getting in. Uh, he has experienced, as many of us have, a situation when it was not snowing at 7 a.m., he usually leaves for work around 7.30 or, or 8. And uh, snow began just after he left, or just after his scheduled observation time. And, but, but he knew that it was only going to snow for a, maybe a half hour, an hour. Then it was going to warm up. And he knew it would melt and disappear. And he pondered, what do I do? And do you wait for that snow to end and report it? on today's date, or do you just say, oh man, it's going to melt and I'm going to lose track of that information, or, and when I come home it'll be gone. In, in his situation, it, was, it snowed till about a little after 8, he did his reading, and then he submitted the report for that day with an 8 o'clock observation time. And that's just fine. But his neighbor who reported at 7 reported zero snow, and he who reported at 8 reported one or two tenths. It wasn't a big snow. And, and it just sort of shows you what, what we deal with. It's not a big deal, but it's, it's a reality of working with data from, from a volunteer network. So just wanted to get that example in because Noah would have asked the question otherwise. So what are some of our other issues. And I'm trying to get my slideshow to advance, and it's not. There we go. So a quick skim through snow measurement. Yes, you know the gauge. The four-inch diameter uh, catches snow quite well if it's not windy. Not so good if it's really wet snow or if it's uh, wind-driven snow. We'll talk about that momentarily. You know, you've heard me talk and demonstrate snowboards and the use of snowboards for getting a better snow measurement. It's simply standardizing the surface on which you're measuring so that, we're, so that you're not pushing it down through a layer of grass or soft soil beneath. You're going down to a firm surface, hopefully in a good location. And yes, rulers, ideally to the nearest tenth, but you, it's hard to find rulers to the nearest tenth. 
So if you have a standard ruler to the nearest eighth, you just have to learn how to equate eighths to tenths, and it's not as hard as you think. If it's a quarter, and we have that, Nolan, we have that online as well for folks if they click on our website under measuring snow, it, it, there's a conversion list. That's right. So, Good suggestion. Yep. Okay. The key thing is that many people don't realize that it's just fine, in fact necessary, to take the funnel and inner tube out for the purpose of winter measurements in snow country. Otherwise, the funnel's just going to clog up. Nothing's going to end up getting down in there until snow melts, and then it'll probably refreeze and crack the inner tube. So just a reminder, if snow is anticipated or rain falls and then sub-freezing temperatures are anticipated, get that funnel and inner tube in. Don't let it be subjected to cold winter weather. Uh, when to measure new snow, this is something interesting because we actually recommend you to not measure new snow at just at 7 a.m. or your standard observation time. But in fact, if it's, especially if it snowfalls during the day and then ends, the best thing is to measure it promptly after it ends prior to settling and melting because the, the definition of snowfall is snowfall is the accumulation prior to melting and settling. And that's why Noah was so uh, concerned about getting a measurement knowing that it would melt before he got home and he would miss out on that. So he stayed an extra hour got the reading, got it in, but wasn't sure what day to put it on. Uh, and well, what I've got is a quick question coming sure. across about taking that funnel and, and uh, inner tube out. What about hail and a mix of freezing rain? Should they take it out then, you're asking? It's hard to know that hail is coming until it comes, and then you don't really I, want I think to they're thinking, I think they're meaning sleet, so sleet and freezing rain type. Of thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sleet and freezing rain are best measured with the funnel removed as well. Uh, but again, you have to melt the contents of the frozen and freezing precipitation inside your inner tube and pour that in through the funnel into the measurement tube to take your measurement. So you see, you still need that funnel and inner tube. You just need it to not freeze over. Uh, and block moisture from getting into the into the gauge. Good good question. And feel free, Henry, to chime in any time a question that's relevant to the current situation comes in. Uh, this is a reminder because volunteers are tempted, particularly when the snow happens. And this doesn't happen often, but it does happen like that, where it falls straight down and level in the gauge. Don't measure the snowfall in the gauge. The sides of the gauge will tend to prop that snow up so it will appear deeper than it really is, or in the case of windblown snow, less snow falls in the gauge than what's often fallen outside. So your measurement of snowfall is taken on a surface of the ground, uh, not inside the gauge to get that new snow accumulation. Uh, and just to give you a sense, and hopefully this little animation will play. This is a snow event in progress. You see it accumulate. It starts about 9 o'clock in the morning, snows for a while. Then, at that point, there's 2.4 inches of snowfall. But then the snow ends by 1 p.m., and the sun comes out, breaks through, and some melting and settling occurs, and it goes back down to 1.2 inches. If you waited till the next morning, you would report 1.2 inches as your snowfall. But if you were fortunate to have the luxury of being home throughout the event, the most ideal measurement for the snowfall for that storm would have been 2.4 inches, the max accumulation prior to melting and settling. Again, we know that our observers won't all have that luxury. Uh, and so sometimes when you look at a fresh snow map, you'll know some people are there catching it at its peak. Some are not having the opportunity until later. But that's why we encourage you to measure right as soon after the event ends as you can so you can get that amount prior to melting and settling. Uh, there no, we go. We've got a question co coming in right now. 
Uh, Chuck wants to know he normally measures every six hours, uh, clearing the snowboard each time, so his total is the six hour amounts added together. Is that okay? That is okay as long as you don't ever do it more, more frequently than every six hours. The National Weather Service would has allowed both six hourly measurements consistent how, with how airport uh, official weather stations did it for many decades, but the observer who measures every six hours won't have as much of an issue with those uh, melting problems and settling problems, but there are occasional situations where the observer that measures every six hours would report more than the observer that measures once a day, even if they catch the peak, just because the weight of the snow for the observer who doesn't clear it every six hours uh, may, uh, the weight of the additional snow may in fact compact that snow a little bit so that he'll be reporting less than the observer that reports every six hours. So I, don't, okay. I hope that is somewhat clear. It's a little complicated. And Blaine, Blaine has just typed in a question saying that in the winter, he adds the warm water to the gauge to, to melt it. Uh, he finds there's always a few droplets that are stuck inside the gauge. Is there a trick to get all the liquid out, or is this taken into consideration with the measurement? So there's, you know, when you add the water to melt it, right. some of it stays on the side. What, what, what's your thoughts on that? My thoughts on that is I know that I'm losing some moisture that deserves to be in the measurement. So I will... And I, the, if you put a lot of drops on the side, you will see that it can equal about a hundredth of an inch or about a half of a hundredth. And as a result, I tend to round up. If, if it's a little less than three hundredths, for example, I'll call it three. Uh, if it's two, four and a half, I'll call it five. But if it's, if it's uh, just short of four, I'll still call it four. Uh, so a little bit, or I'll handle that in how I round. Okay, thanks for answering those questions. We're we're uh, nobody uh, writing them in right now. So <laughs> okay, go, very go good. <laughs> yeah, sure. the the uh, just this is a, a reminder. Probably everybody on the call uh, knows not to do this, but this is a common mistake of well-meaning volunteers when they do their first snow measurement. They get very excited and they type it into the box that says rain and melted snow, not knowing that five, uh, in this case 6.5, uh, 6.5 inches of fresh snow, that you put that in the new snow box, not in the rain and melted snow box. Uh, but again, almost every storm with new observers in areas that haven't had snow again, and this will happen when storms hit the south where people don't get that much snow experience. Uh, well-meaning but misplaced, and our QC people, our quality control volunteers and, and staff will be working on fixing those and notifying the observers to, so that it's a mistake that's usually only made once, but just a heads up to, to avoid that. Uh, okay, this is a challenge, and many of you have experienced it. We love our gauges. They work so well for rain. And yet, when the snow comes, what falls in the gauge is not always a representative sample of what has fallen from the sky. And the main reasons are wind that will deflect the snow around the opening of the gauge, in fact, up and over it, such that in very strong winds, you get almost nothing in the gauge. Uh, and then, as I'll show in the next photo, the wet, sticky snow situation where the snow accumulates on the gauge, but not necessarily in the gauge. Uh, we're interested in what's falling in our gauge. We want to get that water content, but, but is it a good measurement? Uh, and how do you know what, to go, what should go in that and what's not? When it's got sticky snow, we love our little snow swatters or whatever device it happens to be that you can use. If you have the luxury of snow that falls straight down and sticks on the gauge, use your swatter to make an objective determination of what belongs in the gauge and what's not. Remember, it's a beveled rim, uh, it, and if you push the snow straight down, what's inside the gauge will hopefully go in, and what's outside that four-inch diameter circle will fall out 
away it goes, and you have at least an objective, not necessarily a perfectly accurate, but at least an objective method to determine what's in and what's out. Nolan, can we pause for a second? We've got a bunch of questions coming in again, if, if you yes. think this is a good time. Okay, real quickly. Um, the gentleman that was measuring every six hours says, as a follow-up, he also measures when the snow changes to sleet, freezing rain, or rain. So different phase changes. Is that okay to do, or is that too often? It is okay to do. Uh, in fact, it's wonderful to do at that frequency, and it's, and it's particularly wonderful if you if it's significant accumulations of rain, freezing rain, snow or sleet, to submit a significant weather report at those times when the precipitation is changing phase. That's information of great value to the National Weather Service. Uh, another gentleman wants to know how often should he take a melted core sample? So uh, should that be done every six hours? When should that be done? Yeah, the melted core sample is best done on the once daily basis. You, uh, uh, there, it's easier with a with a larger sample, and and that that's what I would recommend. You can do it uh, more often, but it is difficult, cumbersome, and really not totally necessary. If you're doing, if you're in the midst of a really major storm, however, each one of those increments is a well-deserved, significant weather report. And I may not have, I may have pulled those slides from this presentation, but a reminder, if you submit a significant weather report at, say, a six-hour increment or whenever things change phase, it doesn't uh, remove the need for still submitting a total daily report the next year that, or the next day that covers the full 24-hour period. Our system does not automatically add up those incremental reports, but those incremental reports are being used in operational weather forecasting and warning by the National Weather Service and the media. And I think Keith writes in a similar question to that. If the snowfall is Monday and the snow ends at 1 o'clock, on what day do I enter the data? Monday after the snowfall or Tuesday at 7 a.m. when I make my regular entry? And so he could do two reports on that. The he can do two reports. Report. Yep. He can do the significant weather report at the as the snow comes to an end, and then but the total 24-hour daily report is assigned to the next day with the standard morning observation time. Very good question. And, that, and, and Dallas had written as well, where should we report a snowfall after we have reported for the day? Should it go on the next day's comments? And the 24-hour report, you would put that in the, in the next day's uh, report. Yes, anything falling after your normal time of observation goes into your next 24-hour daily report. Even if it's snow that fell Monday morning, you'll still report it with your Tuesday morning uh, observation, assuming it fell after your 7 a.m. observing time. Again, you have the chance of doing the, the significant weather report to give uh, the authorities a sense of what happened at your place that day. And then you give it, when you do a significant weather report, you give the current day's date. But again, the 24-hour daily report is the next morning. And, and the, the questions are coming in so quickly here. I think you may have answered it, but I'm going to write, read it again. Uh, Paul writes, sleet, freezing rain. Do I read the value at the, the scheduled time or wait till it's stopped? Uh, if I take out to thaw the frozen precip, then I'm missing precip while the thawing out is, is, is taking place. So problem, yep, that would be a good example of a, the challenge of the significant storm occurring at your time of observation. With freezing rain, it takes a while to melt, thaw, get that reading. Uh, th that would be a situation where you may well want to do an approximation and submit it then and then come in with a full value and a and a corrected uh, interpolated value a little bit later. But the alternative approach, but this requires having a second outer cylinder, is to have for about half or a little less than half the cost of a complete gauge, you can get an extra outer cylinder. For these challenging winter observations, it is such a huge help. You just put one cylinder out 
uh, an empty one out and bring the other one in and then more leisurely get it melted and get your report done. Thank you, Nolan. Uh, that's it for questions for the moment, so uh, proceed. I feel like I'm taking a final exam here. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 uh, we're about uh, uh, 10 minutes to the top of the hour now, just to give you where we are time-wise. Okay, very good. Now, if yep. what lands in the gauge is, is not an accurate measure, then it's when it becomes very helpful to make that snow core measurement. But you probably ask, well, how in the world can I tell if it's not an accurate measure? Uh, and sometimes you can't tell until you've actually taken a core sample and find out how different they are. But uh, an indicator will be what is your snow to water ratio. Just by walking in the snow, touching it, feeling it, driving through it, you can tell, you can get a surprisingly good sense of the water content of the snow, which ones are going to be dense, which ones are light. And you can then, just by looking at the water content, what was in the gauge versus the number of inches of snow you measured on the ground, you'll have a good sense of whether you're getting a reasonable estimate and a reasonable gauge catch. I would suggest that wet snow well, very wet snow can be as much as five or, or six inches of snow per inch of water. You can literally squeeze water out when it's about a five to one ratio when you're making a snowball. Uh, uh, but you can still have wet snows that are wet, sticky, will make a great snowball, but are 11 to one, even 12 to one, uh, sometimes even more than that. Uh, but those will be your wet snow range. Your drier, colder snows, believe it or not, can also be dense if they're the kind that are with very small crystals so that they land without much airspace. You can have a 10 to 1 at temperatures below zero. But more commonly, the cold snows, some of the lake effect snows will be lower density, 12 to 1. You can even have a fluffy 30 to 1 ratio. You can tell just by trumping your boot down on the ground if it makes a big puff and fluff it's low density snow. If the snow doesn't move at all, it's dense snow. And by getting that sense of snow to water ratio, you're, you're getting a sense of whether your gauge catch is representative or not. Uh, if you just want to know if your gauge catch is representative uh, or if you really are confident it's not, then take a core sample. I'm not going to elaborate on the procedures of core sample or it's got in additional training materials, but you find a representative place on the ground where the snowfall is approximately what you measured as your fresh snow amount. I, again, ideally on your snowboard if that's a good place, and then you get it and do it like a regular measurement after that, melting it and getting its water content. Uh, Nolan, we've got a question that, that goes right along with this. Steve wants to know he's been using a PVC pipe that has the same uh, diameter the, uh, as the inner tube, uh, as the outer tube, excuse me. Um, it's okay to use that uh, for deep, deep stuff? Yes, it's highly recommended. More power to you. We're working right now uh, with people in the northern states and Canada to come up with s sort of a low-cost recommendation of how to use uh, different kinds of PVC. Some are using the lower-cost black uh, uh, kind of sewer pipe. And you may have to bevel the edge to get it to get a, a good uh, cut through the snow. Maybe even cut teeth in it if you have ice layers, which is not uncommon in parts of the upper Midwest and New England. Uh, and then just again, r looking at the form and reminding you where you report everything. Uh, and if you did, in fact, take a core sample, found it to be noticeably more accurate and likely more representative than what you caught in the gauge. Our current uh, methodology is write the best measure into the rain and melted snow box as well as in your core box. But we do want to know what you got in the gauge too, uh, to know if you are dealing with an undercatch situation. Because we know in any given case, many observers will not have that luxury of doing the uh, both measurements. So if, if you did and your neighbors didn't, if you mention it in your comments, we'll then get a better sense of what some of the other gauges in your county might have reported had they done a core sample. 
uh, blah, 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 covering so much ground. Snow depth, just got, you, you need to know, depth is the average of both new and old snow on the ground. I, we find that only about half of our observers who measure snow report snow depth. We assume it's because they're uncomfortable coming up with a representative average. All I can say is you're better, you're better positioned to estimate how much snow is on the ground at your house than I am. So I'm going to trust you to get a reasonable ballpark estimate uh, averaging both the windswept areas and the drifts, but avoiding the tallest drifts, avoiding unrepresentative piles from snow shoveling, et cetera, and just getting your best eyeball measurement of your average depth of snow on the ground. We have you report it to the nearest half inch, but if you can only get to the nearest inch or two, that's darn good compared to having no idea. There is a lot of need for knowing total depth of snow on the ground. Even if it hasn't snowed in two weeks, but you still have some old snow on the ground, we want to know. Report it. And here is the answer to the question about par only the partial ground coverage. The, the rule that it goes on is if half or more of the ground has snow cover, uh, then you're going to report a, a snow depth amount. But if more than half of the ground is bare, you only report a trace. So remind me again what that example question was. Seven-eighths, Henry, seven-eighths was bare. If seven-eighths is bare, seven-eighths was, yep. If seven-eighths, seven eighths, uh, one-eighth is, is not two inches deep, the, the part that's on the ground. In that situation, you would report trace for your depth of snow on ground, and you would report in your comments two inches in on average in shaded areas or where wherever the the other one eighth was so we it's nice to know that but the average since the bulk of the area is bare we're going to report as trace and you can add the other information in comments any other okay, questions good. about that yeah i got a couple other questions not specifically to that but there there's a few coming in here let's just quickly go over those uh, someone from California is asking if you could send some snow or rain out their way. Um, and what, what I, I, sent, I sent a picture of our eight-foot deep snow on the top of Buffalo Pass near Steamboat Springs. I sent it just this evening to the California State Climatologist. And that, that's, where, that's where all the snow, I guess, wound up there from California. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's one. Uh, so if you're weighing with a scale, I don't know if you're going to cover that. But uh, Steve wants to know that is the density of does the density of snow have an effect on the grain weight measurements, or does it all come out the same uh, it, when you're weighing them on the scale? So good, glad you asked, and it all comes out the same. Water ends up being water, and we're, again we're converting that snow to water to get our precipitation and our core, core measurements. And as we found for a two uh, for a four inch diameter gauge, by good happenstance, each hundredth of an inch of water content weighs two grams with a four inch diameter core. An interesting English unit, metric unit, uh, <laughs> mixed units, but they work out great. Uh, Lloyd from Lloyd from New York says he's he measures snow depth on his uh, on his other snowboard, but he's having difficult time finding a representative height reference on the surrounding ground due to grass. Any ideas what to do there? Mm, that's sort of where uh, best judgment, knowing uh, knowing what you have to work with there. I can't give a, a perfect solution. Uh, the depth of snow measurement on grass, sometimes you, you just have to sort of know that to, to subtract an inch or, or so for the empty airspace under the snow layer. But uh, it's just do, do your best, make a reasonable estimate. I can't, if I was there with you, we could work our way through, a, through it, but I can't uh, improve on it from, from my vantage point here. Okay, a couple more coming in. Uh, <clears throat> Blaine uh, again writes, I'm finding it difficult to get the snow depth. We have had a January thaw this winter, and there's a hard ice crust to get through with. Um, any, any ideas? Uh, oh, it, man. It's, it's been a tough time to, to crack through that ice. The, for a, a depth measurement, this is where 
once you're a, an experienced observer who knows you're going to stick with this winter after winter and starts knowing where the land where the snow lands and stays uh, uniformly in your area, you'll want to install a snow stake prior to the winter so that it's already there prior to the accumulation of snow and ice layers. A little hard to say that after the fact, but that's that's the way you deal with that situation and in terms of getting core samples of those you have to have something strong enough with cutting teeth and some of the strong PVC if you sort of uh, file little teeth into the edge you can sort of twist it and you might get through the ice layers you might not uh, and if you can't you just have to not do that measurement. Doug from Illinois writes in that he's on the Illinois prairie and more often than not the the wind means that they don't have any snow on the snowboard. Well, I, I guess if you're in Wyoming, usually the snowboard blows away <laughs> out here. Uh, so you're lucky there, there Doug. Uh, but the question is, um, so how does, uh, what does he do with that? He has drifts and bare spots uh, after most snow events. So how, how would you Oh, imagine? and we saw with that snowstorm that came across the Midwest there on that Sunday a couple weeks ago, uh, that was exactly what many people were facing, especially in the latter phases of that storm. And this is where you take a walk with your ruler and you take an average of multiple measurements representing both the wind cleared areas and the accumulated areas and you do your best spatial average. It may in fact be an eyeball estimate, not just a mathematical sum divided by the number of measurements because you want to get an aerial representation. But pe what people don't know is is the meteorologist, the official weather stations at the airports for many years have had to do that very same thing. And it's an approximate, it's an educated guess is what it is, but it's a darn good educated guess. That's my my approach to that. Okay, Dallas wants to know, do you need a snowboard to take a core measurement, or can you do it without one? Uh, f for fresh snow, when you already had old snow on the ground, for your 24-hour core sample, it sort of needs to be on a snowboard or another cleared surface. For your total uh, water content of snow on the ground, or if there was no snow prior to that event, you can definitely take it right off of any any representative ground surface, grass, etc. Just get something to slide in under that core so it doesn't fall out the bottom. Patricia writes she has a, a lot of large drifts. Some are waist high. Uh, she places her three boards in a known area that is flat. Is it acceptable as the drifts are not included in this measurement? Well, Again, that's a tricky one. Yeah, it's yep. uh, you would have to be the judge of whether your three data points are representing the area around you. And when I say representing the area around you, consider that your measurement is an average of at least your yard and, and, and several others around you. Consider that you're really representing your neighborhood. And if you're a farm or ranch, then you define your area as maybe 100 yards or so around your station. I don't want you driving five miles to get a <laughs> an average and you don't need to walk a hundred yards but but just you're sort of averaging over that sort of scale. Okay, well, one more here and then we'll get back. Uh, Rick writes, he says he has fog drip in his bucket, in, in his tipping, um, in his four inch in his tipping bucket on foggy mornings. He picks up all about a hundredth to two hundredth and everything is wet but that is not technically precipitation. Is that correct? Oh, this is this is truly That's the a tricky one. <laughs> truly the gray yeah. area of precipitation. Uh, and the definition of precipitation is falls from from falls into the gauge as opposed to condenses on the gauge. And with fog, it's you know, with dew, it's pretty clear that it was condensation on the gauge on a clear morning, no clouds around. But with fog, there are particles in the air. And my rule of thumb is often, is it making the sidewalk wet or the street wet? And if it is, I will favor that to call that 
precipitation, whereas if the ground remains dry, uh, that I will often call that condensation and not precipitation. I will, however, put that in my comments and say two hundredths of an inch in my gauge from, from dew deposition. Uh, interestingly, and, I, and we didn't know this when we started Kokoraz, but the World Meteorological Organization has a different definition than the National Weather Service in the United States. And the World Meteorological Organization uh, takes the more broad view that if it landed, if it ended up in your gauge by either condensation or precipitation, report it. And uh, that's a, a more open approach to it uh, than what we started with. Rick wants you to know who just wrote that question. He says, yes, it, uh, thank you. It, it looks like it has rained. So there you go. Yep. There, I, I'm with, with, I'm with calling that precipitation, yes. Okay, Nolan, we're about five after the hour. So uh, All right, we're, we need, you're back. We need to roll down to the to the rest of the finish list. Line. Okay, finish line. Here is an example of a very small fraction of the ground uh, with snow cover and the rest of it bare. That's definitely a trace. Uh, and then if, if half the ground or approximately the half is bare and half has two inches, you report one inch as your most representative average depth of snow on ground. And then in, again, in your comments, you can say about half the ground bare, about half the ground two inches. Uh, bigger drifts in the shade, etc. Just use the the benefit of comments to fill in the details that we wouldn't otherwise be able to discern from just the numerical reports. And then again, because of the importance and uses of snow depth, uh, even though we know it's a hard measurement to get a representative average, we do appreciate the data. Uh, again, you'd be surprised at the importance of the use of total depth of snow on ground, not just the fresh snow when it falls, but then watching how that snow settles and, and disappears over time and then is added to incrementally by later storms. Very useful information. Again, there is what our forms look like and remembering where we put our total depth of snow on ground. Not enough time to really get into the measurement of snow water equivalent, which is the total water content of the snow, all snow and ice lingering on the ground. Uh, because it's a tough measurement, especially in areas with deep snow, we go with just a recommended one observation a week in areas that have continuous snow cover in areas that the snow is more intermittent. Illinois would be a good example of that, my home state. Uh, you definitely record it every chance you get while you have it on the ground because it, it's a dynamic variable. It will begin melting and leaving quickly. We love tracking that snow water equivalent and it's used in the determination of, of flood hazards, predicting river stages, those sorts of things. The water content of that snow remaining on the ground is again a very valued va measurement and we wish that many more people would be able to do that. But it's a hard, tough measurement, especially when the snow is deep. Uh, and again, just no time to elaborate on it tonight and there's where it ends up on the report forms uh, at the bottom. And then that self-populates with NA uh, if you don't enter anything. If you don't have snow on the ground, we welcome you entering zero for your depth of snow on ground and zero for your core. It only takes a second or two. It's often very easily inferred if nobody in your region has, has snow on the ground, but it's, again, useful to have it. Do we have any remaining special situations? Well, we sort of talked about this already, but the wind-driven wind, that's probably a Wyoming picture there. The wind-blown snow where it goes sideways and barely accumulates in the gauge, we simply do our best. Try to And, and wind-blown snow will also be denser snow. Yes, it may fall at cold temperatures, but wind breaks the crystals into smaller pieces. It compacts more. That's why you can sometimes even walk over compacted snow drifts. It is much higher density than the fresh snow that may have fallen. Uh, but you will see that when you take the core samples. You may get high density of snow from blizzard-type snow 
situations. And you say, well, could that be? And the answer is, well, it really can be. Uh, and okay. Yes, Nolan, that, that is right outside of Casper, Wyoming on that picture. Okay. Very, very good. Very. I was driving along. Yep. <laughs> Glad you made it through that, Henry. Uh, a few other what-ifs before we call it a day or a night. Uh, what if very heavy snow is falling? We talked about how you deal with that in the morning and whether or not to report now or, let, or wait. But anytime we're having very heavy precipitation, we always appreciate significant weather reports. And, re and again, on the, on the menu, that's a different item. You go under your My Data over up, up in the upper left and the daily precipitation report is your default report, but you'll find significant weather report, hail report, a uh, variety of other, your, even your, your drought impact reports, your, all your options for supplemental reports are there. Snow that melts upon contact and never accumulates. If there's never any whitening of the ground, but, but it can snow all day and never accumulate. You would report simply what the maximum accumulation was and if the maximum of accumulation was zero, but it snowed, you report trace for your snow fall and zero for your depth of snow on ground. Uh, what if you have freezing rain? Oh, ho, ho. and that's something that I was totally accustomed to growing up in central Illinois. It's something we hardly ever see in many of the western interior Rocky Mountain states. Uh, but what do you do? Freezing rain does not count as snow. It's freezing precipitation, not frozen. So you report its water content in the rain and melted snow box. You report zero for snowfall. Uh, you report the ice, the depth of ice accumulation as your depth of snow and ice on the ground. And then we appreciate comments of the radial thickness. You'll look there at the wire. Oh, it looks like that freezing rain. That, if the temperatures are well below freezing when, it, when it's falling, the freezing rain will accumulate on the top of the wire. If it's just barely at freezing, the freezing rain will accumulate on the bottom of the wire. You do an average, di uh, an average radius, not diameter, average radius, and report that as your radial uh, 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 thickness that you report in your comments. And that observation also has great significance uh, and has a whole user base that looks for that in our comments. Uh, wrapping up. Mm, if, oh, yeah, if, if you're in a hurry, you get a snowfall measurement, but you don't have time. You have to get to work, and you don't have time to melt it and get your report in. Just report N.A., for your rain and melted snow, report your snowfall, and then when you have more time, go ahead and fill in and edit that report to submit the water content later when you have the time. Uh, just a quick review. We don't have time for a quick review. This is what I really want to emphasize is we have a lot of training materials on our website. We have a training slideshow. We have uh, under YouTube, Henry, how many different training videos do we have now on our YouTube menu? Seven, eight? I don't know. We cover practically every situation, even how to measure by weight. We have an ice accretion uh, training uh, slideshow and also a uh, animation. So don't hesitate to go to the website. I was going to say if we had time, I was going to travel to the website. I don't think we really do. You, you know, folks, uh, if you go to the top of our web page, you'll see a little tiny um, symbol for YouTube up top. Click on that. That will take you to the YouTube page, and there's all kinds of stuff on there for training. So, And likewise, we have down just a little farther, we have the... The things to know about rain, hail, and snow. And we have some, some people prefer written instructions, and we have step-by-step -step written instructions for each of the measurements there as well. So we have the YouTube videos. We also have a 23-minute video that we did 
several years ago for the National Weather Service on how to measure snow. Different states have posted videos on how to do the measurements. There's a whole bunch of training options and refreshers. And when it comes to snow and ice, even those of us who live in snow country or semi-snow country, after a warm summer, you sort of forget and you sometimes need a refresher before you start again. So I'm willing to take a few more questions we've been yeah, on. Yeah, Nolan, here's, a, here's an interesting one that just came in. How many flakes or drops are in a trace? Oh, oh, I never thought about that one. That's pretty interesting. This is a... It could be I, one. I'm really glad you asked that because the range that constitutes a trace is substantial. It's any If you saw just a couple of flakes coming down during, your, during the day, it snowed. And if, and if it snowed but didn't accumulate, that is still considered a trace, whereas the stronger trace will be where it's enough to have moisture in your gauge, but not quite enough to make be rounded up to that first hundredth of an inch. So a trace is anywhere from just enough drops or flakes to be noticeable, not even wetting the ground or whitening the ground, to enough to dampen your gauge. It all constitutes a trace. I tend to put in my notes, I will say, a scant trace, just a few flakes, or I will pay, say strong trace, water in the bottom of the gauge, not, but not 100. Okay, and here's, here's a, a person asking, um, they want to make sure before we end that you do not end the session without a farm report from your farm. So just... <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever read Nolan's uh, The Catch, the email that goes out from him, um, he, he talks about all the animals on his farm and, and stuff. And so, But we'll get to that in a second. Here's one other question before that. Uh, how do we analyze snowflakes to report on the snowflake report? Hmm. All right. I, I, should. I, th I think that's part of the... Uh, that, that would be the frost. The frost. Uh, the, no. The frost not... Uh, this is Noah. Can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah. Oh, hey, he's back from his date. How about that? <laughs> right, right. So I would recommend, actually, um, there are, there's a link at the bottom of that frost page to uh, ask questions to the Pennsylvania State Climatologist about that. Um, but there are also links to uh, the types of snowflakes that they're looking for on that actual report page. I think there's just a sp special link that says snowflakes that you can click on to get and, to that. But that's just an optional report, folks. Just a reminder of that. But and Nolan, uh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, when you wonder why would that matter, it turns out that the type of snow crystal has quite a bit of bearing on how meteorological radar will see and reflect off of, off of snow, and it will affect the accuracy of their radar-based estimates of snowfall intensity. Uh, radar does not do a very good job with snow, but if they understand snow crystal type, they can interpret that information better. Okay, well, it's about 20 minutes after the hour. Here's a question, and we'll end with this one. It's your wife saying dinner is ready and on the table. Uh, please <laughs> okay. head home soon. So we're going we're gonna to wind it up for tonight, uh, and we have... Uh, any questions or information, info at cocoros.org. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have this uh, also recorded and hopefully posted on the website. And again, Any parting words, Nolan? Just sorry for the technical difficulties. Thanks for staying with us. Your questions were great. And hopefully others will be able to uh, benefit from your questions tonight as well. So thanks so much for joining us. And we, one goose egg was laid today at the farm. There we go. Well, thank you, folks. Have a nice evening, and uh, thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody.